Welcome back to JMC Live. We still have Professor Richard Kowalski, Communication Assistant Professor at Ohio University here in Chillicothe, Ohio. Now, Professor, we've ended our first segment talking about a short little bio of who you are. You shared a couple of strengths and weaknesses. Uh, now that you're older, and of course, you know, you're much older than me. You're, I consider you an elder, so on I respect very highly. <laughs> but now, now in current day uh, mindset, looking back at what happened with Hitler and communism and Marxism and what happened to family and friends that you now know that may have survived or did not survive the Holocaust, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, after the war, uh, and, and of course before I was born, uh, my family, well, my father was in prison, first of all, during World War II as forced labor. What a lot of Americans, uh, as we currently are involved in Iraq and Afghanistan, I don't think fully understand is that when you fight a war, there's really two things that you need a lot. You need a lot of people, and you need, need a lot of money. And uh, Adolf Hitler, being uh, waging a war of aggression, uh, had both early on. But as the tide turned, approximately 1943, uh, he started taking in people as forced slave labor because you need a lot of people to make ammunition and to make the machinery and to keep all the uh, war apparatus going. And this, unfortunately, uh, there is a good side uh, to this. My father, that's where he learned his trade. My father was a blue collar tool die maker, which is a highly skilled blue collar trade, and that is where he learned it. And then after the war, they went back to Poland. We were basically farmers and they saw how the communists were running the show and essentially they took away property so that you could no longer own it they went from village to village and took the guns so you couldn't do anything really without a gun they did not let you do anything in terms of maintenance to the church and its buildings and I think everybody knows that every building needs maintenance. If you don't, after X amount of years, it will sit, collapse. They discourage you from practicing your religion. And when you look at it from that perspective, you couldn't own property. They were telling you how to live your life, what to grow. And essentially, uh, you know, confined many of your activities my mother's father, my grandfather, the patriarch of the family, uh, decided that it was time to leave. And so we had a Polish church here in America uh, sponsor us. And that is what is meant by being a nation of laws and immigrants by doing it in an orderly way. Many people, of course, today come to this country illegally. We came legally, and that's the way that it was done. You could have a church or another Polish family here sponsor you, because when you come to a country, you simply, when you get off the boat, you know, you're overwhelmed by it all. I mean, where are you going to spend your first night? You're not going to spend it, I hope, not on the streets. There are people who meet you, who know your language, who welcome you, who embrace you, and take you to their home and slowly start the process of acculturation. And we had to wait, of course, to get visas for a couple of years, but it came through. And that's the way it was done, when you are a nation of laws in an orderly manner. And then, you know, my parents became naturalized citizens. I was born here, of course, so that birthright came automatically. And uh, ultimately ended up in Detroit, as mentioned earlier, and continued with my education. And with reference to many of the illegal uh, aliens here uh, to this country, uh, first of all, you know, you can't blame anybody for wanting to come to this country. 
I mean, we do. Most people uh, still consider this country hard to believe when you live in America and you're and you see the problems that we have. That uh, sometimes I think we lose sight of the fact that we still are that beacon of light for a lot of people in a lot of other countries. Now, some people, of course, uh, would disagree with some of our foreign policy and move and leave. But very few do that. Most people still want to stay in this country who are here, not too many leave. And a lot of people from a lot of other countries still want to come here because it is still in large part the land of great freedom, although I think many of these freedoms are becoming a little bit restrictive. It is a great opportunity uh, for economic advancement. Uh, I think uh, most people uh, in this world, regardless of what country you live in, want freedom to be themselves, to have the opportunity for economic advancement, and to better their lot in life, socially, culturally, as well as economically. And if you have a government that uh, represses you by denying you your fundamental rights of speech and association and the practice of religion and economic advancement because they put up barriers and make it difficult for you to do anything uh, with your life, uh, I think that just creates a whole set of problems here. So my father learned his blue collar trade by being in forced labor for the Germans during World War II. That was his ticket for entry to middle class life here in America. And he was able to be the sole breadwinner. My mother, who is 77 years old today, and you may find this hard to believe, but uh, not once in her life has she ever filed a W-2 form. Never paid taxes because she never had a job outside the house, which is hard to believe. She was a full-time mother. When I was growing up in that little Polish ghetto on the east side of Detroit, uh, all of my friends uh, came from families much like myself, where the father was the sole breadwinner and the mother was a full-time mother. And uh, divorce was rarely uh, heard of. It was there, but rarely heard of. All of my friends that I hung out and played ball with and uh, was in Boy Scouts with I had uh, a full-time mother. Uh, I think it is generally considered that the family is the basic unit of a society. And if you tinker with it and allow it to change too much, as it, I believe it has, then that opens up the door to a lot of uh, problems in this country. For example, currently in the year 2010, in the state of Ohio. One in ten Ohioans is on some form of public assistance, whether it would be welfare, unemployment checks, uh, food stamps, uh, women and infants children program, and a lot of other programs. But one in ten are receiving some form of public assistance. In the United States of America, in the year 2000, and 10. A country of just over 300 million people, one in 30 Americans, one in 30 is in prison, on parole, or on probation. One in 30. And it certainly was not that way back in the 50s and 60s when I was growing up. So uh, you could sit, you could you know, point your finger, I suppose, at a lot of things, the extremely uh, socially uh, permissive decade of the 1960s, when things certainly loosened up and contributed. And you can point to other uh, variables as well. Uh, but the point is this, I believe, that the, uh, and I teach, remember, been doing this for 30 years. I see a lot of people in my classes, uh, especially women. and. Uh, the family unit, as I know it, I have to remind myself that it is now a minority point of view. We'll be right back with more of the professor.